Well, hey, everybody. It's 710, so we're going to start this next event. Um, for the people who uh, are going to hear my welcome speech 40 times <laughs> during the Spring Rights Literary Festival, um, sorry about that. But I want to welcome everyone to the second event of the Spring Rights Literary Festival. It started tonight. There are 38 more events, so definitely check out springrights.org. I'm Robin Schwartz. I'm the CAP Program and Grant Director. Um, throughout the event, we'll keep the audience on mute. And uh, if you've taken yourself off during the, our little chat, just put yourself back on. Please use the chat uh, for questions and comments. It's really nice to see things happening in the chat because um, and we know people are there <laughs> and listening, especially when people turn off their video. So, so definitely keep contributing through the chat. I wanna thank our wonderful Spring Rights sponsors, Ithaca College, Wegmans, m and Bank, CFCU Community Credit Union, the Odyssey Bookstore and the Ithaca Marriott. We also receive funds from New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers helps us pay our participating writers. Um, our festival is free as are all our community arts partnership events. But we always have to ask for donations. So if you feel moved to donate any amount to the awesome Community Arts Partnership, I will put not only our website link, but a direct link to PayPal in the chat. And you could visit our site if you don't know a lot about the Community Arts Partnership to learn about everything we do. Um, I want to introduce Mickey Quinn. She's on the call with us. She's an event producer, among other things, and she's helping me with that technical part up tonight and she's also here in case I disappear or my, my internet goes out. Um, she, one of the things she does is uh, as an event producer, she runs Trampoline, Ithaca's premier monthly competitive storytelling event. And on Thursday, May 13th, one of the Spring Rights events is a trampoline event. Is it like All Stars? Um, it's a curated event uh, because of the theme uh, change. So it's stories about um, both in um, climate change and social justice and um, people's you know personal stories around that. Um, and so I've got uh, so I've got some all star storytellers who are coming in with specific stories around that theme. Great. That's going to be great. I'm so happy. It's such a fun event. I've read a story there once and I got a, I got a, a little squeaky duck. Um, uh, we can begin uh, for this group reading. The first artist that's going to read is Mary Lorson. And uh, Mary, you can uh, take yourself off mute when you're ready. Mary is a writer, editor, she's a producer, she's a musician living in Ithaca, New York. I took, I took this off of Wikipedia, Mary. She is best known for yeah. her the lead singer <laughs> of alternative pop groups, Matter Rose and St. Lowe. She has organized many awesome spring rights events in the past. We were just talking about that. So we will highlight Mary and um, you could say more about what you're gonna read or just start whatever you like. Sure, um, hi everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you for making this happen, Robin and Nikki. Um, I'm bringing some creative nonfiction to tonight. Um, it's pretty raw, pretty rough. So um, thank you for helping me work it, work it, work through it. <laughs> um, working title, Walk the Line. Um, and I guess I'll just be looking down. So that'll be the, the, what the picture is. Um, if you test, sorry, if you'd been tested that week, you could call to make an appointment for a 15 or 30 minute porch or window visit. Porch visit was better because you could see the person just over the railing, even if you did have to sit on a folding chair in the driveway. But if the porch visit, but if the porch visit for that time slot was taken, and it usually was, then you had to do the window, which was frustrating because the window itself had to be closed. So you actually had to make a phone call. It confused her to see you right in front of her, but still need the phone. She looked back and forth at the phone in her hand and you in the window, pointing at her hand, trying not to get flustered. And then she'd press the wrong button and hang up on you and then shrug as if everything was ridiculously amusing. The window visits were really just mugging and smiling until you gave up. I called my old friend Randy with an update. She made a prediction. Maybe your mother will meet a man in there. I shook my head and said, you must be kidding. After a few, sorry, after a few weeks, a new routine emerged. Get the test, make the call, show up for the appointment. They'd wheel her 
out and she would light her face up with a smile, letting the mask slip enough so you could see her lipstick. She loved small talk. She'd tell me a few things she wanted, describe the nice friend she'd met inside a man, a handsome man actually, though really just a friend, she insisted. He was, gonna, he was going back to Norway in a few days. I ask his name. She squints, Ellie, Elsie, some name that sounds like a woman's name. It's Norwegian, she shrugs. Well, it's nice you've gotten to know each other, even if it's just for a little while, I say. Sure, says mom, I'll be going home soon anyway. I made sure to let my friend Randy know that her, her intuition was spot on. Mom was admitted mid-August, evaluated for a month of rehab, and then deemed completely unable to live independently and admitted for real. After a month of, a month of paperwork, the stay would be indefinite. The other rhythm quickly established was one of the late night or early morning phone calls from Ella, the duty nurse, fulfilling the legal op obligation to inform me that mom had fallen. These were usually not da damaging drops per se, more like slow motion slides, but anything a resident, any time a resident had contact with the floor, the family had to be told. So once or twice a day, I'd see the nursing home name pop up on my phone. The appointments, two a week, you arrived, you checked in, then you waited sometimes for 10 or 15 minutes while the staff got the person up and out. I gazed to the right at my son's elementary school. When he was in kindergarten and first grade, the school would put on a Halloween parade for the elderly, an adorable little neighborly intergenerational spectacle, the snake of princesses and superheroes, up to see the old folks. After a couple of years, it had been kiboshed by some fundamentalist Christians. The circle of life is not lost on me. In August, it's hot. In September, it's lovely. In October, it's fine unless it's raining. But by Halloween, I wondered what winter would be like. Impossible to imagine these fragile people bundled up outside in January. One day while sitting in the driveway, I asked the activities director if I could volunteer again, like I used to with my students. No volunteers allowed, she said, but I do need to hire a musician. I calculated the opportunity. Overextended already, I didn't want another obligation, but how else would I get to see my mother? No one knew anything. We didn't know where we were on the curve. It wasn't good. I realized if I didn't do it, I'd have practically zero access to my mother come winter. So I applied. I submitted three references. I got fingerprinted and I scheduled two shifts a week, Wednesday and Sunday, to provide music. Gaining entry with the various codes, take my temperature, fill out a form, don two masks, the paper one, plus the plastic face shield, and then I enter the inner sanctum of quotidian care, muddled with fear and discomfort from the sadness of this crazy disease. The first thing I notice is a unique smell. Not unsweet, not really unpleasant as an odor, but unpleasant nonetheless, as it carried with it fraud association and other smells, cafeteria food, rubbing alcohol, industrial cleaning solvents, shit. Fluorescent lighting, inconsistent decor, the break room, the pretty and large activity room empty now, except for the COVID testing area encampment, the fish tank, the windows, the birds, there used to be a cat. My high school students used to help out there setting up oversized bowling pins for wheelchair bound players to heap kickballs at. Now there are people in hair nuts buzzing around. They work in the kitchen, they work as aides, the board, excuse me, uh, where am I? The nurses, Etta, finally in person, Georgette, Hannah, and Tom. By the way, I changed all these names. Um, where everybody else was tired and bored, the activities director is like an angel. We are here to engage and connect, she said, to cheer them up. It's supposed to be simple. We know what music does for all of us, how it ignites our brains and muscle memories and invigorates our spirits and moves us to emotion. But the structure of this gig is an enigma to me. They needed a lighthearted troubadour, and I have been that, but I was not now. Singing in a mask, no one seeing you smile, ignoring the shit smell, trying to hide my fear. And what the hell to play? Mostly I play my own songs and nobody knows those. I made a list of the simple things I used to sing in the subway or for my kid. Run, boy, run, Griselda. Should have known better. Who'll stop the rain, constant craving. I realized that my own personal repertoire of covers hues to the dismal and obscure. Songs in the street are different from songs in the nightclub are different from songs in the nursing home. I recall that my very first public singing performance was in a nursing home in Irvington, New York in fifth grade. I was in my school's choir and we played there and um, we played in a nursing facility housed in the pink mansion of Madam C.J. Walker of hair straightening chemical fame and fortune. I remember a very, very bony, very, very old woman reaching out her chocolate hand and holding mine, smiling through her tears at me as I sang. I remember being scared at first and then not. I'm not a child. This is not about me, my performance anxiety, or my depression. I'm supposed to take attendance, go room to room, write down who hears some music. Don't take no for an answer, says the activities director. Carrying the clipboard, the guitar, the song list down the hall from room to room. Start at the beginning, I tell my nervous self. Just start at the top floor. 
Mom's on the lower level. By the time I get there, I'll be less freaked out. I knock tentatively on the first door, gently push it open. Man lay on his back, nose to ceiling, eyes closed. Don't let anyone say no, the activities director had told me, but I backed out and went to the next room, whose door was open. Both beds were inhabited, one with an ancient soul curled up, face frozen in a silent scream. Her roommate, though, was sharp, alert, and bird-like, upright with a yellow top and beads. Hello there, I said. Well, hello, she smiled. Would you like to hear a song, I asked. Amen, she said. Okay. I fumbled with the papers in the attendance sheet. Are you going to play that thing or are you just going to stand there? I'm going to play. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. It's a sweet song. Innocuous, historic. Interestingly edgy if you think about Woody Guthrie and the depression and income equality. Her head bobbed willingly enough, but not captivated. Okay, she said. Amen. Next room also has two women, both awake and upright, but that's all they have in common. Carlita, oddly shaped stone sculpture of a face, yellow haired and sat like a child, muttered and knitted her brows. Her roommate, Patty, was social, repetitive, but still, ver still verbal and friendly and comfortable with me. What kind of music do you like? Patty says, I like country music, that's what I like. How about you, Carlita? She shrugged, hummed, shook her head. I know Delta Dawn, play that one, I love it. Delta Dawn is a funny structure. It starts with the chorus. Delta Dawn, what's that flower you have on? I opened my eyes. Patty, Patty was smiling. Go on, she said. She was 41 and her daddy still called her baby. It's an odd tale about a woman who supposedly lost her mind after some man broke her heart. I feel this is too sad, so I opened my eyes, but now Patty's are closed. She's listening and remembering something. I wonder about her as a younger woman. She seems to be in her late 70s, I guess, so her sex bomb years would have been in the 60s, maybe. Think about all the sex bombs that grow old and folded and shrunken before they die. When I finished, she opened her eyes and she thanked me. I moved down the hall. Not everyone wanted to hear a song. People were busy with their phones or puzzles or Hallmark Channel movies. Sometimes they suggested songs I know but can't play or songs I never heard of. Sometimes they played those songs for me and I'd say I'd try to learn them if I could find the time. Michael, a friendly fellow with a sing-song voice, another one not that much older than me, shaggy hair. This guy clearly had a life. He described his, his childhood for me. His mother left him and his two siblings after their father, with their father, who raised them in a carnival. Yes, his dad's family were carnival people, and his grandparents filled in the gaps. His dad was not warm, but was responsible. He performed a carnival barker spiel for me and allowed me to record him. Hey, three balls for a quarter. Get a ball on the bowl and win yourself a goldfish. They don't bark, they don't bite, they don't chase the neighbor, and if you don't like them, you flush them down the toilet. Tiny was an aptly named, named very, very old man, surrounded with sports memorabilia, deaf as a stone with the radio blasting. Lana is there because she's anorexic. She's younger than me and shrunk in her teeth, looking cartoonishly like they want to burst from her face. My family have given up on me, she says. They sent me here to die. Over the months, the patterns of repetition continue in the soundbite life stories. I was a school bus driver in Oswego for 30 years. My family has given up on me. This is all my daughter's doing, amen. At some point, I think of just the right song. I can't believe I didn't think of it sooner. Sweet dreams till sunbeams find you. Sweet dreams that leave your worries behind you. Gunilda is from Germany and she swoons. Oh, if he could just hear you sing that song, he would just love you forever. She says, who would? Sure, man, she says, her green eyes unblinkingly wide. Well, I don't have one of those right now, I smile at her. And she smiles back with her impossible laser beams. Oh, you will. She and her much older but still gracious roommate, Janice, seem genuinely entertained. Say dirty night and kiss me. Just hold me tight and tell me you'll miss me while I'm alone as blue as can be. Down the hall, I meet Susie, pretending to feed her dolls. My kids are so messy, she fusses fondly. Would you like to hear a song, I ask? Her roommate Becky says, no, thank you, quite nicely. But Susie says, I would love to hear a song. I used to play the piano at my church every Sunday. I really miss that. I say, how about Amazing Grace? Oh, sure, she says, love that one. So I start, and I can sense her humming the low part. Louder, I say, sing it with me. And she does. And damned if her roommate doesn't add a perfect higher third part to the harmony. After an hour, I've made it to the top floor and head down to the, lower, to the lower level where mom is. The mask is hard to sing to, through and it's itchy and it's hot. I get out the elevator and there's my mother not wearing her mask in a wheelchair with lipstick. Oh, Mary, she says, you're going to perform now, aren't you? 
It's not quite a show, mom. I'll be playing room to room. She looks like she's been expecting something from me and I feel like I owe her something, but we can't visit. I've been told not to pay her extra attention while I'm in there. I'm not allowed into a room or to sit next to her. I have to keep moving, mom, I say. Okay, she says, I know you're busy. And I say, no, mom, it's the pandemic. She shrugs, but wheels down the hall along with me. And then I just notice, just then I notice that a tall and broad, not very old woman with shoulder length silver hair has been pushing mom's wheelchair. Who's your friend, mom, I ask. His name is Elsie, mom says. He's from Norway. Hi, Elsie, I say. Hi there, Elsie says, smiling back. Over time, dream a little dream becomes a standby, a sweet classic with a loving message that isn't insipid. The male nurse comes in to do something. Well, she's no mama Cassie, says, pointing an elbow at the resident, and I try not to take umbrage. I play it a lot. He also says, I think there's a broken record around here. Walk the line is my other standby. Geraldine, another resident who doesn't really look that old. She has a robust body and a fabulous head of hair. I don't know why Geraldine is here, but she lies in bed listlessly, humming the same tune over and over. You can hear it down the hall like a basso bird. But walk the line, wakes her up. Hey, Geraldine, I say, and she smiles at me, and not invariably, but most of the time, she'll get up and she'll sing it along with me. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. Geraldine gets up out of bed, points her finger at me with emphasis. I keep the ends out for the ties that bind because you're mine. I walk the line. Mom passed away on December 27th and I took a month or so off. When I felt ready to return, I drove to the home and I reached in the glove compartment for my employee badge and my masks. Pulling them on for the first time in many weeks in my car, I smelled the smell. And I had the surprising thought that maybe that odd sweet smell wasn't from the nursing home, but from inside me. That's it. Is it too long? Okay, good. <laughs> That's lovely. It's working. It's a work in progress, but thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful, Mary. That was really wonderful. I love that you incorporated your singing as part of the story. That was that was really cool. Thanks. Oh, Thanks. I was nervous. <laughs> Turning my camera on. Um, so the next artist, thank you, Mary. The next I artist we're going to hear from tonight is Dan <coughs> Kopkow. Dan's fiction short story collection, worst period, date period ever, that title totally makes me want to read it, um, was published by Regal House Publishing in March of 2020 and was named one of 2020's top 100 novels by the community of literary magazines and presses. His cyberpunk noir novel, Prior Futures, will be published by Black Rose Writing in December of 2021. And Worst Date Ever is available everywhere you buy books. And uh, Dan's website is dancopcow.com. And if you ever want any of the artists, I'm reading actually from the participant bio page on the Spring Rights website. So if you want their websites or their web links, it's all on that participating artist page. So I will now turn the mic over to Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Robin. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my short story collection, uh, Worst Date Ever, is about romantic dates gone horribly awry. And I'm gonna be reading a story called Astronaut Tang. Um, and to avoid any confusion, it's a, a female narrator. Astronaut Tang. I just hate science. Science has ruined my life. It has ruined the world. As a horticulturalist, you would think I'd be enthralled by methodologies, pr procedures, and facts, but lately, universal facts and processes don't mean much to me anymore. Come to think of it, I don't just hate science. I hate people. In fact, I find this whole damn planet detestable. The flying cars, the portals that teleport you to China, the 200 year lifespans, all of it has long ceased to impress this woman. I'm in one of my dark moods, my coworkers insist. But walking through the city, how could I be otherwise? I steer clear of the barbed wire fences that serve to restrain and confine unregistered citizens. A few minutes later, I pass hordes of anti-sterility demonstrators brandishing signs fashioned from old flaps of cardboard with menacing slogans. I eye them warily through the screen of my helmet visor. My coworkers warn me not to walk alone, 
Government proclamations always seem to set people off these days. I am not alone by choice. My boyfriend disappeared three months ago. Beneath my black antibacterial coat, I'm wearing the nano vest he gave me, which makes me feel as if we were somehow with me. I trudge through the next checkpoint past the dark helmeted armed guards. The air feels thicker here, the body odor of packed people inescapable. Where's a stiff wind or a rainstorm when you need one? Finally, it's my turn and I pass through the pod gate, avoiding eye contact with the cameras and the guards. The city pod implanted in my skull at birth registers my information on the screen inside the pod gate. Gardner Fletcher, 211, citizen, registered voter, female, 29, single, no offspring. A guard presses a button and the pod gate opens, a green light illuminating its perimeter. I enter the city proper where I am immediately confronted by more crowds. Occasionally, a citizen resembles my boyfriend and my heart leaps. Then, inevitably, I realize it's not him and I feel humiliated because my funny little heart dance was performed for a complete stranger. When I arrive at the square, a long line of people wraps around itself in a circular fashion like a coiled snake. In the center of this coil are two of the biggest pod gates I have ever seen. One pod gate is marked Decade Erasure and the other is marked Wait for D-Link. Tens of millions of good citizens have journeyed here to walk through these gates. I haven't decided yet how to cast my vote through which pod gate I intend to walk, but I have hours in line to make my decision. Several people in front of me are entertaining themselves with a holographic drinking game. I find it difficult to concentrate with the noise and distractions around me. And with hours to wait, I close my eyes and let my thoughts drift back to the first time I met my boyfriend. My fellow gardeners and I had attended a pro-procreation rally six months before in one of the city's rough outer boroughs. I wasn't really into the whole procreation cause, but spending my evenings alone in my home cube seemed less and less appealing. No one got out of hand, so the government drones remained in observation mode. Afterwards, we went to public bar 782. A group of nanoscientists were leaving as we arrived. I locked eyes with one of them, a man with jet black hair, matted and rumpled as if he'd just removed his helmet. There was an aura of gentleness about him and his eyes were kind. I felt an instant attraction, which was unusual. I don't typically find other scientists very appealing. His friends called him, but he lingered while we made small talk. Our city pods exchanged all relevant contact information. Nanoscientist Tang, 53. Citizen, registered voter, male, 29, single, no offspring. Our exchange lasted 90 seconds, but it changed my life. That night, I couldn't stop grinning. On our first date, nanoscientist Tang 53 seemed reserved, but gradually opened up as if he were one of the flowers in my lab. His reticence, he blamed on the government and the secret project he claimed to be working on, about which he could tell me only three things. There was a project. It was secret and he was working on it. Regardless, we laughed at each other's stupid jokes, flirted shamelessly and got along marvelously, as long as I didn't ask him anything about himself. I discovered early his fear of commitment, which did little to put me off. We dated for three months and while we knew we couldn't be physically intimate, I had thought in this time I would know something more about him. I found his mysterious nature romantic and seductive that last night, I told him I was falling in love with him. He smiled and we ordered another round of drinks. He dropped me at my home cube and flew off in his hover pod. That was the last time I saw him. The people in line behind me are broadcasting drone photos of themselves as heroes of humanity. I realize the world may be coming to an end, but I find myself inconsolable, not for this reason, but because my boyfriend has gone. The starry sky begins to glow in a familiar steel blue as the government sky screen broadcasts its weekly report. The news anchor, a tanned, self-satisfied journalist, stares down at us. Citizens, he begins, tonight you will cast your vote in what is the most important decision mankind has ever faced. As you know, several months ago, scientists discovered that the size of the universe was equal to the collective length of the unraveled DNA strands of planet Earth's human population. As our population has rapidly increased, 
so too has the universe continued to expand and is in imminent danger of ripping itself apart. The government has subsequently forbidden breeding and issued mandatory sterility radiation for all its citizens. Brave scientists implementing a daring plan to save us all has been sent out to the edge of the universe, the universe mission crew. So now citizens, I urge you to not let the universe mission crew down. Vote for decade erasure or wait for D-Link. Well, that was freaking helpful, I thought. Do I wanna wake up tomorrow with the last 10 years erased? Do I really wanna place my faith in a bunch of scientists and astronauts who weren't smart enough to get out of a mission they'll never come back from? And if I do vote to travel a decade back in time, will I remember what's happened since then? The scientists are sketchy on this point, as well as many others, since we've never done this before. This day and this vote is all anyone has talked about for months. You'd have to be dead to have missed out on the news. Maybe my boyfriend is dead, which would explain why he hasn't reached out to me. The steel blue of the sky screen begins to glow again. Citizens, we have late breaking news, the anchor exclaims. We are receiving a live feed from the universe mission crew, which we'll now bring to you. No way, I thought. Citizens of Earth, I was one of the scientists who volunteered to go on this mission. My, reason were, my reasons were not noble, but cowardly. Oh my God. Our mission is to interrupt the link between humanity's DNA strands and the expansion of the universe so that the latter can expand at its own natural pace. Our other theoretical option is to force a contraction of the universe and thereby reverse its expansion. The second option would cause time to temporarily reverse, effectively erasing the past 10 years. Now, I have some good news and some bad news. What the hell? The bad news is that I am the only survivor of the universe mission crew. My fellow scientists did not make it through the hyperdrive space jump. I am astronaut Tang, and since there are no other astronaut Tangs remaining, I now have no number designation. The good news is that I can complete our mission. I have reached the edge of the universe and both options remain available to us. I can de-link us from the fate of the universe or we can go back in time. In addition, however, I have a personal message for Gardner Fletcher 211. This can't be happening. I'm sorry I didn't call you back after our last date, but as you see, I had to go and save the universe. Also, I feel I'm at a sufficiently safe distance to tell you that I wanna break up with you. Citizens, I've come to the conclusion that I should make this weighty decision on behalf of all of humanity. Gardner Fletcher 211, I did not enjoy our recent dates. You were moving too fast and, and I wanna erase the memory of my ever having dated you. Hold on, I scream to the sky screen. The people around me stare, then they begin to laugh. Goodbye, Gardner Fletcher 211. Goodbye, citizens. Wait. I approached the university registrar to enroll for the next semester's classes. I'm contemplating a major in horticulture. A cute guy is standing in line in front of me and I decide to take a chance. Isn't that what being 19 is all about? Hi, I say, I'm Kelly Fletcher. Hi, he says, turning around. I'm Clayton Tang, nanophysics major. Ooh, physics, I just love science. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So are all the stories in that book in the same world? Are they all set in the same world or? No, they span lots of different genres. Um, this one just happened to be sci-fi. Um, so no, they're, they're kind of all over the place. They're humorous. There's some horror ones. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like dating. It's a little bit of everything. Yeah, that's fun. I'd like to read it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dan. Sure. We're gonna move on to David Gaspari. David was trained as a pure mathematician and considers himself to be of all post 19th century mathem mathematical logicians, the funniest. In addition to technical papers, he has published fiction, essays, humor, and reviews, and has had plays performed in states, <laughs> totaling 313 electoral votes, as well as five foreign countries. Thank you. Turning it over to David. Uh, thanks, Robin. Uh, it's a shock for me to have to say uh, that this piece I'm going to read is mostly about things that happened almost 50 years ago. Uh, it's called Rowing Over. With exceptions only for World War, 
Cambridge colleges have held the May bumps every year since 1887. They take place with typical English logic in the second week of June. The boats in a bumping race start single file in as straight a line as the river cam allows, a length and a half apart. The goal is to bump into uh, some boat ahead of you before it bumps some boat ahead of it or you are bumped from behind. The next day, bumpers and bumpies swap starting slots and run the race again, four times altogether. Every year, each college crew inherits the starting position from the one that is outgoing. The goal over many generations is to bump all the way to the top and become head of the river. Life at the bottom is less a grab for glory than a desperate clinging to hope, not bumped yet. When I was a student, the sponsor of the Churchill College Boat Club was Noel Duckworth, a World War II hero and British Olympic Cox, and also the college chaplain for whom the boat club was a primary pastoral duty. Oxford and Cambridge chaplains originated from two pure strains, the intellectual urbane and the rugby rowing of which Canon Duckworth was what biologists call a type specimen. That meant on race days, bicycling madly along the towpath beside the cam to shout like some Yorkshire Casey Stingle, incomprehensible encouragement in an accent impenetrable. He could be alarming when understood. When an old boy came back to be married in the college chapel, the canon chose to preach on Proverbs 2611, a dog returneth to his vomit. Every year the canon awarded boat club beer mugs to one of the college crews. His 1972 honorees, My Boat, the eighth boat, had not been preseason favorites. Out of 129 entries in the May bumps, we were ranked on merit 128. Though half the crew were Americans, we triumphed in the most British of ways by demonstrating the superiority of pluck and moral fiber to mere skill. The presiding spirit of that happy few, that band of brothers, if not oarsmen, was Andreas Gerasimos Michalatianos, born in Alexandrian Greek and raised in Queens, New York, and killed by a brain tumor 20 years ago. A souvenir photo survives, an action shot. We are forward, about to drop the blades. I'm with the scrawny types at the bow end, looking grim. Andy amidships is stocky, chubby, to be honest, and gasping for breath. Inked in Gothic script on the surrounding mat are our names and weights. And in the space for recording victories, the words road over, which means that having never bumped or been bumped, we endured that for four days, we dueled the worst boats on the river to a draw. Embarrassed by evidence of what I don't do well, I, I couldn't bring myself to buy a copy, but I often snuck up on Andy's in hopes that the passing years would somehow put our strokes in sync, make our splashing less wild. Scraps of self-knowledge have accumulated over the decades. My priggishness was not pride, but sloth theologically understood as the refusal of joy. We had been cast in a comic role, one he had the grace to accept, but I did not. Our very first race inscribed the eighth boat forever in the annals of moral fiber. At the gun, our stroke, the leader sitting sternmost, gave an overexcited heave that levered him out of his seat to land him in the bottom of the boat. We fired on half our cylinders while sorting out the mess, but the boat behind us did not close. Before the start, idling in the mild current, they had failed to hold position and swung crosswise to the stream. When the gun went off, they were still struggling to straighten out, backing and forthing with frantic maneuvers more suited to a driver's test than a boat race. 
The rest of the field charged ahead beyond the reach of either boat. The best we could now hope for was a draw to complete the whole course unbumping and unbumped to row over. We settle in for the long haul until the moment Aristotle would call the peripeteia. Immediately behind me, the bow oarsman drops into the water a blade that's not quite square. As it's sucked beneath the boat, he lets go, the only alternative to being flung overboard, and ducks while the shaft flies past his head. It remains attached, straining against its lock. We have reconfigured to seven working oars and a sea anchor. He leans out to wrestle his oar from the slipstream, threatening but somehow failing to capsize us. With a miracle of will, he retrieves it. But by that time, we've been caught. In fact, we're overlapped. And the safety of the finish line seems infinitely distant. Our Cox adopts evasive tactics in the circumstances, not unmanly. Every time a bump seems inevitable, he flicks the rudder and our stern somehow slithers away from the pursuer's lunging prow. Eventually, we two are the last boats left on the river, a comedy duo to amuse the raucous crowd along the final reach. We weave across the widening river like a pair of punch drunk lightweights who barely manage to answer the bell. Through the hubbub, I can somehow hear the cannons bang at its most Stengelesque. He cries out in some unknown tongue for heroes. About to faint, tunnel vision setting in, I lift my oar from the water. On the reasonable seeming grounds that I could do with a short rest. Bow comes forward and slams cursing into my back. For the next few strokes, I keep out of his way by sliding back and forth, cradling the airborne oar in my arms. And when my head clears, start feebly to pull again. Hours or seconds later, we cross the finish line, rode over, we're number 128, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves a curse that they were not there. Backs are being slapped, a stomach empties overboard, the cannon is beside himself with joy and admiration, and three more days like this one loom in prospect. And he slumps across his oar and sputters his all-purpose bywords of amazement and relief. Bloody hell. His funeral took place in a different world, one with jobs and mortgages and families. Nature cooperated, sunny at church and graveside, the Maryland landscape rich with warm fall colors. As I drove back north toward winter, through bare Pennsylvania hills, clouds moved in. The sun reappeared in late afternoon, and for a few miles I chased a rainbow, which was apropos. My friend had been an astronomer, an expert on the sun, a specialist in its spectrum. Our photo teaches nothing about how to pull an oar, but the sight of that comically weak flesh moves me to ask for grace the grace to know that it's a sin to refuse and offer joy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. You know, David, this is funny. David actually sent me the last line of what he was reading so I would know when he would stop. And uh, because I'm, re re I'm unmuting myself and putting my video back on, but... Uh, that was actually very helpful. <laughs> um, thank you, David, so much. That was great. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, next up is Brenna Fitzgerald. Uh, Brenna is a writer, editor, and creativity coach. She holds an MFA in creative writing and has published work in a variety of literary journals. As a coach, she supports writers and other artists and entrepreneurs and anyone seeking a deeper engagement with their life and creative potential. 
Brenna is actually teaching uh, a Spring Rites Literary Festival workshop on Thursday, June 10th at 6.30. The workshop is called Infusing Writing Practice with Intention. And Brenna's workshops have been uh, some of the most popular at Spring Rites for many, many years. So check that out. Thank you. And I will turn this over to Brenna. <laughs> Thank you uh, everyone for being here and thank you Robin for that introduction. Um, so just to introduce my piece, um, at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all in lockdown and cooped up alone or with our families, um, I interviewed my partner. And so tonight I'm reading an excerpt of what came out of that interview. And the title is Love in a Time of Survival. My partner, Tim Drake, has been preparing to survive the apocalypse since he was 12. In those preteen years, he and his best friend, Trevor, formed a group that decided they would move to the wilderness forever. They gathered tools, they saved seeds, they stashed all supplies in the forest. In a cave-like root system of an uprooted tree, they piled pots, pans, shovels, knives, axes, and saws. Tim and Trevor did not smoke pot, not usually at least, but traded it for radios and other hard to get supplies. The group started small, but grew after successful initiations for those who were eager and brave enough to sleep outside naked for one night. Newly admitted members had to pay monthly dues of $10. All cash was converted to quarters because personal experience proved that quarters would survive a fire. Eventually, Tim and Trevor saved close to $1,000 in quarters, which they then loaned to their parents with interest, but sadly lost all the money when their parents failed to pay it back. Now, 43, Tim is still a resourceful risk taker. He has survived many extremes from weather to mid-age weariness. He can tell you that midlife crises are a real thing. When we first met five years ago, he was reading the book Radical Acceptance by Tara Brack, having just quit his position of 20 years as director of a wilderness education nonprofit and ended a 10 year relationship not long before. He told me he wasn't looking for any kind of serious or long-term coupling. Within six months, his inner risk taker cracked that big heart of his wide open once again. When I moved into Tim's well-lit wood floored country house one year into our relationship, I noticed big bags of rice and lentils in the basement and expired cans of beans in the pantry. I thought he must eat a lot of rice and beans. Then at parties with his wilderness survivor friends, everyone said they'd choose Tim when the zombie apocalypse hit. His teenage son Rowan agreed. I totally hit the jackpot, I said often, joking to myself over the years as I witnessed Tim build fires from sticks and shelters from leaves, chop down trees, wire houses, install ceilings and floors, take apart bathroom pipes. He could mend just about any broken thing, including people's lives that seem to be falling apart. Tim teaches mindfulness and nature connection. And if either of those things won't soothe an aching heart, I don't know what will. Survival is defined as the state or fact of continuing to live or exist in spite of difficult circumstances. The heart beats, the body breathes, when I asked him what led to his obsession with survival, he said he didn't really think of it as survival. I didn't really think about it at all, but looking back on it, there's a little understanding that life in my family situation was all survival. Stepping into the woods was a creative way to play with that, said Tim. Tim grew up in a log cabin built by his parents, Larry and Nancy. The cabin had one bedroom to house a family of four children. His parents slept in the bedroom and the children slept on couches in the living room. His grandmother lived in a trailer on the same property. So sometimes the children would sleep on pullout couches in her living room when things got crazy at his parents' house, went at his parents' house, which often happened on the weekends with drinking and partying. There were always children around. Kids of all ages came and went. It felt like a train station or a boarding house, he said. Even though there were no spare rooms, people crowded inside. My mom brought home stray cats and dogs and people, said Tim. One time he came home to a baby foal on the couch, just sitting there. Over the years, they housed raccoons, pet squirrels, chickens and goats, lots of farm animals, some of which we ate, said Tim, some of which we petted and some of which we did both too. 
His family had their own close relationship to nature, which was more on the level of frontiersmen and some subsistence living. They hunted for food, they had trap lines, they fed the family from those sources. They came from a longer line of farming families and knew nature. My mom and dad let me run around in the woods freely and unsupervised, far from home, said Tim. There was an old school bus we camped in. My dad would take us out in it sometimes. A few times we went to the Adirondacks. It certainly helped me to feel comfortable outdoors, brave. Spending hours of carefree kid time in the woods around his house, Tim developed his own relationship to nature. The web of life outside became a second family for him, one he loved and longed to protect. Over the years, Tim appreciated his family's connection to nature, but quickly noticed a missing component in their relationship to it. The reverence was not there, said Tim. That was hard for me. They burned trash, they buried trash in holes in the ground. Growing up, Tim harbored a lot of judgment about these habits of his farming family. But now that I'm older, he says, I see how everyone creates a lot of harmful trash. We just don't see where it goes. Nature has played a central role in Tim's adult life as it did in his childhood. So central, in fact, that he struggled to describe his relationship, relationship to it. Oh, geez, he said, that's like saying describe God. He took a long pause when we broached this topic. It's hard to find words, he said. In Zen, they talk about the finger pointing to the moon is not the same thing as the moon. I can only try to describe the finger pointing to the moon, he said. Tim went on to describe nature as all of his family wrapped together in one. Parts feel motherly, parts feel father-like. Then there's a kinship with nature, the sisters and brothers of trees and waterways. There's a responsibility he feels for it too, a father-like protection. Then there's gratitude that this is where all life comes from, said Tim. There's reverence. There's the awareness of the utilitarian side to it all. My home is made of wood and rocks. There's a desire to try to find a way to pay back all the kindness and gifts that have come from the natural world. There's an awe at all of the unknowns, a mysterious aspect to nature. I will never know who this natural world is. Some of that is exciting, some is frightening. In survival situations, there's direct contact with the possibility of death that most human beings, especially those with privilege, do not face on a daily basis. Tim and I spoke about the coronavirus pandemic and how it's highlighting the inequities of systems in which humans operate, as well as the fragility of life, something privilege hides from us unless we consciously seek situations that put it at the front and center of our awareness. This is the gift of survival. Tim aspires to enter survival situations, especially those in nature, with curiosity. He seeks experiences that dance on the edges of fear. Unlike some wilderness survival folks who use these kinds of tests as a way to prove their superhuman strength, to boast about invincibility, Tim uses them as reminders of his own fragility. He doesn't brag about the mountains he has climbed or the thunderstorms he has braved. He is simply filled with awe. On a recent family trip to Bali, Indonesia, I sat on the beach with a book in one hand and a coconut in the other, while Tim and his 17-year-old son, Rowan, ventured on a steep climb down to Nusa Penida Beach at the base of a rocky cliff. They descended to the sand line ocean on near vertical stairs and rickety bamboo ladders, nervous about how much arm strength it would re require to climb back up. During that hike, my body had a difficult time going back to the top, said Tim. The heat exhaustion, my arms shaking. It was humbling to have to sit down for long stretches of time to rest. It was also empowering, he says, to have done it to experience the raw natural beauty. What made me fall in love with Tim when I met him four, five years ago was his courage and his vulnerability. The way he cries after heart opening yoga poses, the way he picks up red, red salamanders on our hikes and strokes their backs the way he loves through the pain of loss, even the loss of those who may have hurt him in some way. He celebrates emotional outbursts. This is progress you are feeling, he says, and then holds me as I sob after a fit of uncontrolled pandemic rage in which I fracture my right heel. Tim has taught me to slow down too. 
When we walk together in nature, he stops every few minutes to take a photograph of a leaf or to point out a bird song. This habit used to try my patience. I wanted to race ahead to bypass the ferns and reach the peak of the mountain. I used to walk in nature like my life depended on it. My speed, a manifestation of anxious thoughts, my legs running from my own self judgments. Yet over time, his pace has taught me important lessons, the value of slowing down for everything, the highs and the lows, the joys and sorrows. Now I feel it all, even my most challenging emotions, even those feelings that shut me down. I let myself feel lost. With Tim, I see every detail, all the colors and textures of an imperfect human life. Thank, Thank you. you. I love that. That was really nice. Um, everybody continue to put your comments in the chat. That would be great. Next up is Lizzie Frank. Lizzie grew up in Newfield, graduated from Hofstra University in Long Island. Lizzie's work can be found in Font Literary Magazine, Growl, Rejection Letters, Nonsense Humor Magazine, and Stone of Madness Press. Thank you. I'll turn the mic over to you, Lizzie. Hi, thank you, Robin. Uh, Brenna, that was really lovely. I, I really love, enjoyed that piece a lot. Um, I'm gonna read a little, uh, uh, kind of like a fairy tale that I uh, wrote last summer for a program I'm going on this summer. Um, now the international travel uh, is tentatively opened again um, to Prague. Uh, so that will be a lot of fun in July. Um, and I wrote this as part of my application. Um, it's a little bit dark, but not too dark. So I think I'm gonna dedicate this one to Mickey Quinn, who I know loves semi-dark things. She was a servant in his house and came to clean his table one night. Her name was Helga and she was barely 19, but she had no hopes for a good match. Thick glasses rested on her crooked nose and enhanced sad, repellent eyes. She walked like a lame goose with one shrunken arm pinned to her side and an angled leg that left scratch marks on the floorboards wherever she went. A love sparked inside Helmut from the first moment he laid eyes on her. No, it was hatred. It was obsession. He wandered the hickory streets of Prague at nighttime, dodging through stone pathways that cut between buildings. He saw her sharp face in muddy puddles, reflected amongst the stars. He saw storm struck trees and thought of the way she moved as jagged and incalculable as a lightning strike. Helmet followed scratches on his floor like a map through his house, retracing her steps. He caught a pigeon with a malformed wing, killed it and left it in her cupboard as a gift. They married in December after a quick but ultimately successful courting session. He was a prince, albeit the 13th son of 15. Her father was a Croatian fisherman who masqueraded as a Navy man with a thick ink blue jacket that smelled not of the sea, but of a distinctly human rot that suggested it had been filched off a de dead body and left unwashed. Her father laughed when he dumped her at the end of the aisle. She's your problem now, he taunted. He left with his dowry and promptly drowned, not six weeks later, but the money had all been spent and drank by then. Helmet thought that when he had her, when she was finally his, that he would be able to break out of the spell she had cast over him. She was his property. Legally, he could treat her as he wished, even kill her, but he couldn't bring himself to do it, not with his hands or his belt or his knife. Nightly, he rose with the intent to snuff her out as she slept, but she never slept. He felt her skin on his fingertips when they were in separate rooms. He couldn't kill her. Every time he tried, she was able to distract him. When his baby was born, he wept. He took his son from the midwife in the minute he was born. He washed the babe clean with his own hand and cloth. He pressed kisses to his son's forehead until he grew afraid he would give the boy a rash. He named him Vaklov, which meant wreath of glory. Helmet's son grew quickly, most often on the lap of Helmet himself, taken away by a wet nurse every few hours. Helga stayed in her bed and did not touch the boy, not even on birthdays. Helmet often stood in her doorway at nighttime and watched her blanket rise and fall in accordance to her breath. During the day, he thought ceaselessly of her, her black straw hair, her corroded teeth. He dreamt of the bloody scratch marks that stained her ceiling. He woke with her name midway through his lips. 
She came to dinner one night during Vaclav's fourth year. Helmut scraped the back of his knuckles against her razor blade chin to show his appreciation. She snapped her teeth and pulled blood from two of his fingers. He paced in his room for several hours that night. He held his own head underwater. He dug his fingernails into his eye sockets. He rested his forehead against the door and tried, tried to find the strength to keep away from her. It was late at night, not two hours from dawn, when he finally succumbed to his addiction. He considered the delay to be progress. She was sitting upright in bed, hands folded in her lap. Her face, bare except for peppercorn freckles, bent towards the starry window. Don't, she said, with a voice that scratched him like an alley cat. Make me wait again. He rattled his chin and bit his tongue from the force of his nodding head. I will leave you, she said. He stumbled. Had he misheard? I'll break the spell and leave your life forever, but you have to do one thing for me first. Three days later, on the winter solstice, Vaclav led the lamb out of the city. They were both young, bare things and almost the same height. Helmet led Vaclav up the mountain until stone steps devolved into chunks of stone, devolved into loose rocky hillside. They climbed until they came upon a flat plain protruding from the side of the mountain. What's the lamb for, Papa? Vaclav asked him while Helmet tied the lamb to a supple tree. Because I must obey my God, said Helmet. He rested a heavy hand on his son's shoulder. If your God ever comes to walk the streets and live in your house, you should do whatever it says. Vaclav's lips tugged downwards. His father's answer confused him further. Your God wants us to kill the lamb? I am a good servant. Helmet's eyes rolled up towards the sky. He shook himself back into his body. I am obedient. Helmet patted on the smooth white stone. Come here. Vaclav took long steps to catch up with his father. His hand slipped easily into Helmet's, but Helmet did not let him linger there. He boosted Vaclav onto the rock. Lie back. The boy did. He had no reason to disobey his father. Helmet pulled a soft package out of his jacket pocket. Soft, but deadly. Helmet unwrapped the cloth and gripped the handle. He had sharpened the blade that morning. He wanted it to be quick. He wanted it to all be over. He wanted to sleep again. The lamb, Vaclav shouted. Helmet's head snapped up. The lamb had tugged the rope loose and was trotting into the tree line. Helmet turned back to the blade. He caught his own eye in the metal. A ray of sun burst through the clouds, making his reflection appear to be winking at him. Papa? Close your eyes, Helmet muttered over his shoulder. He shook his gaze away from the blade and turned it to his son. With Vaclav's eyes closed in that reclined posture, he could be asleep. If it weren't for the rise and fall of his chest, he could be slumped over dead. Helmet's stance cast a shadow on Vaclav's face. Papa? Quiet. Helmet's tongue was a snake that lived in his mouth. It bit and bit and bit. Vaclav turned bright red and his face became wet with tears. Helmet's empty hand reached out and pressed to Vaclav's shoulder. Too hard, he told himself, gentler, gentler. His other arm raised the knife over his head. He could do it, yes, he could. He could clean up his life. It was a neat exchange. Helmet had to get rid of a good thing if he wanted to get rid of a bad thing. It was a sacrifice. It was faith. Helmet sucked in breath in anticipation. He could do this. He would. But Vaclav felt him breathe. His eyes opened, and then his mouth fell ajar, and he howled. Helmet dropped the knife. It fell into the sandy dirt at his feet. I'm sorry, Helmet whispered breathlessly into Vaclav's shoulders. He squeezed his boy against his side to keep him from shaking apart. I'm not going to hurt you. Papa loves you. I won't hurt you. Helmet pulled his sleeve over his palm and wiped clean Vaclav's red cheeks. This was the babe he had washed clean in the first hour of life. This was the head he had kissed to sleep. Helmet knelt down and tapped on his shoulder. Climb up, he said. Vaclav rubbed his eye until it turned pink, but then swung his little leg around Helmet's back. Helmet ran at a jog all the way home, down the hill and over Charles Bridge and up the steep winding stone streets. He had to beat down his own door to get inside. Vaclav clung tightly to his neck as Helmet ducked through kicked in splinters. Empty. The table was bare. 
The window curtains were missing. Helmut staggered to the cabinets and ripped them open. A spider spun in the corner as if Helmut's gold-rimmed plates had never lived there. The halls were bare of their paintings. Helmut leapt through and into the sitting room. The couch remained, but the hand-woven carpet, the crystal chandelier, the baby grand piano, all gone. Helmut bounded up the stairs to the bedrooms. The first door, his. He turned the knob and sucked in at the sight of his bare mattress. At the sight of his bare room, what had she done with his bed frame and mattress? And Lord, all of his books, his journals, his lifetime of studies, had she burned them, taken them with her? Had everything simply fallen away when she stepped out of the house, like, like waking from a bad dream? He pulled the door closed. It was as easy as saying goodbye. The next door, hers. He opened it and spent one mesmerized moment staring into the ruby pit. Blood dripped from floor to ceiling, glimmering and oozing from the walls. Vaklov released a squeak. Helmet slammed the door. At the end of the hall, Vaklov's door waited for them. Helga hated the boy, or at least hated Helmet enough to hate Vaklov for Helmet's overflowing love of him. Helmet bit down in his tongue, tensed all of his muscles in preparation to run, and determinedly kicked the door open. The first thing Helmet saw was Vaklov's baby blue blanket stitched with stars in a crescent moon. The next was Vaklov's toy easel still set up in the corner with his child-sized child smock looped around the top. She had never been able to hold him when he was a baby. She had not touched his room. Vaklov yawned in Helmut's ear. His tiny yawn sounded like that of a baby deer. Are you tired, lamb? Helmut felt Vaklov's nod against his shoulder. With a soft groan, Helmut hooked his elbow around Vaklov's waist and lowered him to the floor. Sit on your bed. Vaklov rubbed his eye and obeyed. Helmet knelt over and pulled out the knot on one bootlace, then struggled longer picking at the other, which was worn with burrs. Hold still, he told Vaklov, who'd been gently kicking his boot against the, the bed frame. Helmet wiggled Vaklov's shoes off and left them at the foot of his bed. The boy plopped backwards into his pillow. Helmet pulled back the moon-stitched blanket, untucked it around Vaklov's chin, which bent into his chest and caught the slowness of his breath. Helmet pushed a bit of hair out of his son's eye and left a careful kiss pressed into his forehead. There was a spare blanket folded, there was a spare blanket left on the reading chair in the corner of Vaklov's room. Helmet fell into the chair and pulled the blanket from underneath himself. He eased into the hard decorative cushion and threw the covering over his shoulders. He was sticky with dried sweat and his shoes were still on. He apparently had no possessions left in his house. He had no wife. No Helga, no Hell Queen with her beautiful skin and her delicate arm and her soft walk. Vaklov snored gently. Helmet closed his eyes and was pulled into sleep as easily and simply as the moon orbits the earth. He never thought of her again. Wow, thank you. I was completely mesmerized as you were reading. Hey, um, if anyone has any questions for any of the writers, Let's put them in the chat right now. So Lizzie, did you go to any spring rights events when you were growing up in Newfield? Um, I, I definitely did. My mom is a um, nose robin. My mom's done a bunch of the workshops that used to go on um, and she carried me along to all sorts of stuff. <laughs> that, is your mom Joyce? Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, yay, hi Joyce. Um, uh, while we're waiting to see if anyone has questions, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited about the festival and I can't wait to go to the other 38 events. Uh, please check out the schedule. I put it in the chat and share the news of this festival with your literary, literary loving friends and they can be anywhere in the world. That's what is so great about Zoom. So um, I don't see any questions, so I'm just going to thank everybody for coming. If anyone wants to take yourself off mute and attend the after party, I'll be here <laughs> for another 10 or 15 minutes if you just want to chat and say hi. But this event is officially over, and thank you so much to all the readers. <laughs>